October uh, Center for the Study of Race and Democracy event, The Power of the Vote and uh, Racial Justice in 2020. Um, we are pleased to be in dialogue with uh, a Longhorn Hook'em, <laughs> Austin native, uh, Ambassador Ron Kirk, uh, former mayor of Dallas, um, U.S. Trade Representative, uh, mayor of Dallas from 1995 to 2001, U.S. Trade Representative during the first Obama uh, administration. Um, and right now, uh, Ambassador Kirk is senior of counsel in Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher's Dallas and Washington, D.C. offices, where he co-chairs the International Trade Practice and is a member of the sports law, public policy, crisis management, and private equity practices groups. Uh, UT uh, School of Law, um, class of 1979, proudly, uh, and really um, just one of our active uh, citizens, sits on the boards of corporate and nonprofit boards, uh, was raised in the age of segregation and then became um, really this active citizen, social justice, civil rights uh, leader in our country and elected official. Uh, so welcome Ambassador Kirk and, and we're really pleased to, to have you. Dr. Joseph, thanks for the kind introduction. Always good to be with you again. And, and um, what, what, a, what a great time to be with you less than now 12 days away. Yes. From um, what will be, I think, you, every time I say this, I almost go, we mean it this time, but perhaps the most important political presidential election of our lifetimes. But what, what an exciting time and what an appropriate time to be talking about the power and the importance of the vote. Yeah, and I want to, you know, we had a great podcast and I got great feedback. Uh, we received great feedback from a podcast that we did a week or two ago about the power of the vote. And you talked about some of your story and I want to start with that, um, your story, because we, you're very unusual because you are a native African-American Austinite. <laughs> uh, not, not as an unusual as a Texan, but as an Austinite, because as we know, as Austin has become this, this wealthier city, you know, this city is predicted in the next two decades to make the most and create the most wealth. It has become less blacker. It's very interesting, right? There's more gentrification and we're about 7.8% of the population now. I'm sure that is a much less percentage of the population than when you uh, were, were here. And so uh, I, wanna, I want you to share with us your story of, like I said at the start, you, know, you grew up in, um, here in Texas uh, before the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. And, and so the, you, you remember um, aspects and regimes of the old Jim Crow system and also your relationship with University of Texas. You're a proud Longhorn, but at the time, um, Black folks weren't really made to uh, feel welcome to, to the university, the 40 acres, even though Heman Sweat uh, famously desegregated the law school in 1950. And like you point out, without the sweat case in Texas, there is no Brown case. There is no Brown case. So sweat is this watershed huge case. And our first undergraduates, the precursors, gain access to the school starting in 1956. But still facilities were segregated, dorms were segregated. There weren't black professors on campus. It wasn't the full student experience of being a Longhorn. So I want you to um, share, you know, sort of you growing up here um, in Austin, and it's great. We have time to really. <laughs> you're, you, but you're making me feel <laughs> really, um, really old. Oh no, no, no! I and I don't mean that. I mean just the history. I think it's so important that you've you've lived. You know, Obama called himself the Joshua generation. And I think you're really right there. I know you're a little uh, a bit older than President Obama, but the Joshua generation that came after Dr. King and was able to really utilize uh, the opportunities that Dr. King and those th that movement cre created. Well, one, thank you for having me. And those of you on the webinar, thanks for joining us. I know this is an audience broader than the state of Texas, but for purposes of at least this first phase, I'm gonna speak as if you are at least reasonably familiar with Austin or the University of Texas. Um, as Dr. J, as I like to call him, noted, I am a child of, of segregation. I'm 
66 years old, just to frame this. So I was born the year of Brown versus education. For those of you who are familiar with the University of Texas, uh, you literally could take the footprint of the campus, go a mile east of I-35, almost equidistant between what we now call, what we now know as Martin Luther King Boulevard, which used to be 19th Street when I was born, and Mana Road, and that's where, for the most part, where I was raised. Uh, but as as Dr. Joseph said, I, if President Obama sort of represents the Joshua generation. You know, I define myself as a test tube baby of the civil rights movement. My parents were contemporaries of Dr. King, Balmer Overton and others. They were that generation who struggled, fought, worked alongside people as different as President Lyndon Johnson and then, you know, hell raising Ann Richards before she was a Tarrant County commissioner to do away with the poll tax, to get the right to vote, to get civil rights, voting rights, housing discrimination, the right to education so that their children, that me and my siblings, so many of our generations wouldn't suffer all of the indignities that they did. And I was raised, um, born on a street called Olive Street, just a few blocks north of East 12th Street, the famous barbecue place you all stand in line <laughs> now for every Saturday I 35 in my neighborhood. Um, you couldn't have paid white people to cross I-35. Uh, every day as a kid on the weekends back then when we were kicked outside every Saturday to go play, we would ride our bikes all the way over to the Capitol lawn because it was just beautifully manicured, a great place for kids to go playing. But our parents always cautioned us to be careful because we could never go inside to use the restroom. We had to drink from a colored water fountain out on the grounds of the Capitol. Every morning of my life as a kid, I walked out the door, I could look at that tower at the University of Texas, but we were sobered by the reality that, that my parents were not welcome there. Uh, they attended Houston Tillotson College, which is where they met and married. So I have had an interesting love story with the University of Texas, with my citizenship. But what I tell people, the, the beauty of this story is in one generation, if you think about it, I was born into a state that, state that denied my parents the right to vote, mm -hmm. that they had to take a literacy tax test. They had to pay a poll tax. And in less than one generation, the same university that did not welcome people of color um, awarded me a law degree. Mm -hmm. I went on to become Secretary of State to Governor, now Governor Ann Richards. And in one generation, the same state denied my parents the right to vote. I'm now the Chief Elections Officer enforcing the rights of all Texans. So one, it is both a story of denial, but a story of extraordinary promise when people of goodwill, people who believe in the genius of every child, no matter their age, their race, their ethnicity, their immigrant status believe, you give those children a chance to get a quality education, remove all of the artificial guardrails on what their ambition can be, and the sky is the limit. And one of the reasons I'm so passionate about this topic today is I think we need to reconnect with that reality, reality that it all starts with exercising your right to vote because it affects every avenue of our lives. Whatever your particular issue of conscience might be today, whether it's racial justice or criminal justice, healthcare, immigrant site rights, women's reproductive rights, the rights of the LBGTQ community. All of those now are decided at the intersection of legislative activity and the power of the courts to uphold those actions as legal or illegal. And by not voting, if you care about those issues, you are yielding that decision-making authority to someone 
who may or may not have your interest at heart. Uh, but one of the reasons that I have always remained committed to civil discourse is I don't think someone who grew up like me that watched my parents struggle, fight, suffer, all manner of indignities for me to have the right to be able to attend Austin College, the University of Texas, Howard, Hampton, to vote or not vote, to not vote to me would be an insult to everything that generations of Americans did to make real that, that promise in the Constitution that every citizen should have equal right to this citizenship. And nothing's more central to that, to me, than the right to vote. You know, Ambassador uh, Kirk, talk to us about um, how did you get into politics um, post law school? What was your relationship with one Governor Ann Richards, um, who's a legend uh, in the state of Texas and the last Democratic governor in the state of Texas? But how did you rise to uh, become Texas, um, become the Secretary of State? Uh, and even before the the being the, the the mayor of Dallas, but what what got you so interested to use the law degree? Certainly, you've worked at law firms, white shoe law firms. You're at one now in Dallas. But what got you into uh, thinking that becoming an elected official? You know, you've been a state official, you've been a city uh, leader, basically the CEO as mayor, and you've also been a U.S. A U.S. trade representative, which is a federal level you know cabinet position. So. Tell, tell, tell us about that. How, do you, how did that evolution happen? Um, well, you know, Pernell, Pernell this, this may sound completely unctuous because the last thing I wanted to do as a young kid thinking about my education and what I wanted to do was to be in elective office. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting, you started, and I'm glad you did, highlighting the fact that Sweat versus Painter uh, was the precursor to Brown versus Board of Education. Mm -hmm. The lawsuit brought in the 40s by Heman Sweat and Virgil Light, uh, Virgil Lott, who we can't forget, mm -hmm. a native Austinite, challenging the fact that the University of Texas wouldn't allow Black Hispanic kids to study at law school. Ultimately, that led, you know, to the building of Texas Southern University and Prairie View. But even as a very young kid, I knew who Thurgood Marshall was. Mm -hmm. And I had begun to formulate a belief that it felt like more advances towards racial and social justice were happening in the courts because of courageous lawyers like Thurgood Marshall and principal judges than was happening in the legislature. The legislature always had another excuse for why it just wasn't the right time to pass Voting Rights Act. So that's what animated me toward a career in the law for reasons I articulated earlier, having, you know, and maybe it was the, 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 the inherent benefit of growing up in Austin, a city a little more progressive than the rest of Texas, having people like Jake Pickle and Lyndon Johnson, later Ann Richards there, who was a family friend and I'd known since I was literally a teenager, you know, I, I just could not be involved in voting. And my father in particular, once we got the Voting Rights Act passed, um, and my father integrated the Postal Service mm -hmm. in Austin, something he was very proud of. He was a World War II veteran, but there was nothing he was more proud of than being a precinct judge when we got the right to vote and being sort of that steward and guardian to make sure that everybody Black that wanted to vote was able to vote free from intimidation or discrimination. All of that was embedded in me as well. But I always thought I would make a bigger difference by being a part of the legal effort, the legal fight for racial and civil justice. And so to fast forward it, I get my law degree, I'm practicing law. I am on that path to being, as I having a career, as I'd like to say, as one of freedom's trustees but I was always still involved in the political life of our community. And when Ann Richards ran for governor in 1994, Neyland Youngblood, a great friend of mine in Dallas, Senator, now Commissioner Rodney Ellis, who was a state senator, 
former um, councilman from Houston, but another friend, graduate of UT Law School. We put together the first group of sort of young business professionals that said, we not only want to support Ann Richards, but we're going to raise money for her. Because traditionally at that point, Black folks gave votes. We weren't as good about backing up our votes with money. But long story short, uh, that was a brutally tough, not only a general election against Clayton Williams, it was a tough primary. Uh, and Governor Richards prevailed and offered each of us the opportunity to serve in her administration. And initially they were opportunities that didn't conflict with my path of being a lawyer and providing for my family. So initially she appointed me to serve uh, as chair of the Texas General Services Commission, then Secretary of State. And then as you noted, when the opportunity came, I ran for mayor. But while I was in law school, like 90% <laughs> of the kids who go to law school or the LBJ Public Affairs School, we all had part-time jobs in the Texas legislature. Okay. And I worked as a researcher. So fast forward, by the time I got there, I had worked in the Texas legislature. I had had the opportunity to work for US Senator Lloyd Benson in Washington. And then I had come back to Dallas in the early eighties to run their government affairs practice. And so at that point in my life, I realized I was one of the few people that understood government from the state, local, and federal perspective. Uh, and as Governor Richards and I would often talk, even though I had uh, higher ambitions to go be a successful partner in law firm, make a lot of money, the number of people of color, of women, of immigrants, that are privileged at least to see inside the bubble and know how it works is small enough when the opportunity comes to leave. I, I don't know that we have a choice but to answer that call. And I did. I just want to say that um, you said 1994, so it's her 1990 election. No, I'm, I'm sorry. 1990 was when she was elected governor. 1994 was when she appointed me as Texas Secretary of State. Okay, and and what made you um, interested in being mayor of Dallas? And I also want to talk to you about your time as mayor of Dallas, and really, you know, what are you um, proud of? But also, you got to see how democracy is made, um, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, and what is the real power of the mayor, but what, what is the real power of different corporate interests, people's interests, democratic interests, uh, different special interests, right? So what, how'd you go from being um, Texas Secretary of State appointed by Ann Richards to being mayor of Dallas? Well, as, as I mentioned previously, I, you know, by the time, while I was serving as Secretary of State, one, the current mayor somewhat surprisingly announced that he would not run for a second term. And even before um, I had gone to work for Governor Richards, when my wife and I married in 1987, my wife so, you know, went to the Wharton School as an undergrad, brilliant economist, banker, uh, and she always told me, my greatest fear is someday you're going to want to scratch that political itch and instead of making money, we're never going to have a dime. And I literally told her, <laughs> but now I said, you know, I've worked in Washington office in Dallas, and I believe the most dynamic job you can have accepting being president of the United States or Supreme Court justice or governor is to be mayor of a big city because you get to run things. And lo and behold, when the opportunity came open, Dallas was a city with extraordinary resources, but couldn't get out of its own way. We were mired in racial divisions. We were experiencing in Dallas in the early 90s what the country is experiencing now in terms of racial justice, issues of policing, disparities between the police and the African-American and Hispanic communities. And I remember, and the Governor Richards took me to lunch, called and invited me to lunch one day. And typically she'd have, you know, four or five people in her administration. We'd go to lunch, talk about what we're doing, talking about everything. And of course I said, yes. And I remember asking her chief of staff, you know, who all's gonna be there? You know, is Dr. J gonna be there? <laughs> she goes, it's just you and her cowboy. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, what have I done? 
but you know, we had this conversation about this, the mayor's office. And she says, all these people keep calling me and telling me it's time for you to heal the city. And I gave her all the reasons that I didn't want to do it. I had by now a three-year-old daughter and a six-month-old daughter. I wanted to make money. And long story short, she said, you have been privileged to peek behind the curtain and understand government in a way nobody can. And I remember she said, I can make all the speeches in the world to little black kids about how you can grow up and be anything. She said, but the reason women resonate with me is because they see a divorced mother, reformed alcoholic, rise to the highest lights of leadership in the state of Texas. And you have all these blessings. You've been granted all these experiences not to sit on the sidelines and lead. And I'll be honest, it was something I kind of wanted to do. I mean, she didn't have to talk me into it. My father used to always ask my brother and I when, you know, when we wanted to do something crazy. And it, you look back and our parents get smarter the older we get, but he would always just ask you one thing. He'd say, all I want to know is, did you jump or were you pushed? Right. And his, his deal was, I'm just saying, he said, the landing's going to be better if you jump. That's all <laughs> I'm saying. So I don't want to make it sound like anybody drugged me into it. It had kind of been in my heart, but I looked in the mirror and thought, you know what? I can do this job. I know how the city works. I have a passion for leadership. I can afford to do this. The timing's right. So I made the decision um, to get in the race. And fortunately, uh, it, it ended up being one of the, the, the highest honors of my life and one of the greatest experiences of my life. Yeah, and I want to talk to you about being mayor of Dallas as we move forward, because this is a great conversation. And I, I, I'm thinking, I always had it in mind what to our conversation be a conversation about democracy and voting, but really through your biography, and we're going to come all the way up to the present because you've touched so many different aspects. I mean, you know, um, uh, aspects of foreign policy, domestic policy, urban policy, you know, the financial system and how that can work in a big city. Uh, you know, the law. I mean, so you're really a, a font of knowledge and a wealth of information. I, I so much enjoy talking with you. Um, you join a second generation group of African-American mayors who I've studied as a scholar. So you're joining David Dinkins, yourself. It's very interesting because there's this earlier wave of Carl Stokes, Tom Bradley, Coleman Young, Maynard Jackson, Richard Hatcher, right? And you, you know, uh, there's a middle generation of people like Moon Landrieu, right? And, and right. You, you, you join um, um, this generation of, of mayors who sort of take power in the 90s. And there's some federal officials and state officials, people like L. Douglas Wilder in 1989, huge, huge historic figure because of being the first black governor of Virginia, right? And so what I'm interested in is, you know, what do you, what do you learn being mayor of Dallas? What, what surprises you about being mayor in terms of some of the limits? And then what surprises you about being mayor about some of the accomplishments, things that you can do as mayor? And when does it sink in? Because obviously there has to be a learning curve because as brilliant as you well, are- I'm, I'm gonna cut you because you're, you're worse than your questions go. And we've only got an hour. <laughs> you, you, as brilliant as you are, you still have to have right, some- let, let me say a number of things. On the job training. Um, I love being mayor. And I would say to anyone watching this, no disrespect to city council, the legislature, but I've always thought, if I'm going to be in the game, give me the ball. You know, I didn't have the talent to be Andre Ware, Tom Brady, quarterback. <laughs> but my thought is, one, governing is hard enough. But it is a science. It is, the, it is an art. It is a science of bringing people together. And you mentioned, for kids like me, for President Obama, every environment we've been in in all our life has been sort of structured by we're always either the first black, the first woman, how do I fit in? How do I bridge these worlds? My life was an exercise in bridging two worlds, finding common ground to sort of move forward. That's what you do in the world of politics. Second, I represented 
the first sort of ways of black mayors, not just elected in a city, with an overwhelming African-American population. Mm -hmm. That generation, Carl Stokes, Maynard Jackson and others. Third, I'm glad you mentioned Mayor Jackson because I always define myself as the fifth first black mayor of Dallas, both to educate our audiences on the stupidity of Jim Crow, what we lost, but not only was Maynard Jackson, but um, Emmanuel Cleaver, who went on to become the first black mayor of Kansas City, was born in Waxahachie, te Texas. Willie Brown, who went on to become the first uh, and longest tenured African-American speaker in the history of the state of California, mm -hmm. then went on to become the mayor of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Carl Bradley went on to become the first African-American mayor of Los Angeles. Maynard Jackson, all of them were born in Dallas or North Texas mm -hmm. and left this state because of Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. So one, I carried with me the admonition of my parents when, as we mentioned, you know, my generation was privileged to be the first to get to do so much. And my father always reminded us, this is great, but no, you're not doing this because you're better than us. You're doing us because we've opened the door and given you the chance. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to judge you by being the first. I'm going to judge you by whether you're the last. So one, I carried with me that humility of knowing while I had that privilege of making history, I had to make sure that I made a difference. Secondly, I was among a generation of African-American mayors who were elected to lead cities that weren't broke. Mm -hmm. Typically by the time blacks, women, Hispanics get elected mayor, all of the businesses have fled the city, the city's hollowed out, the city's budget's a mess. And then of course they turn to us and go, okay, Dr. J, you get to be president. Well, President Obama too, right? The great yeah, I didn't, I didn't inherit a break. Dallas was a city of enormous wealth. Dallas just couldn't get out of our way. We couldn't decide how the politics worked out. And so I thought if I could just get us to focus on our common dreams and aspirations, get beyond whether you were black, white, Democrat, or Republican, that if I could get us to change our culture and thinking about how we wanted to do business, we can turn that city around. I made a big bet, it paid off. I loved African proverbs. Um, I ran in an open seat. Um, when the mayor stepped down, you got him, and there were seven of us, nine candidates. Three of us quickly emerged as sort of the, the three real candidates. One was a very fiery, dynamic, young, Hispanic um, lawyer, leader. Um, Domingo Garcia, who had the added benefit of being mayor pro tem of our city council. The other was this tall, distinguished, white lawyer, president of the Dallas Bar, chairman of the board of Hughes and Luce Law Firm. I mean, right out of central camp casting, <laughs> Daryl Jordan. And I came up with this proverb uh, for my campaign that said, two people in a burning hut don't have time to argue. And it resonated with people. And my point was, look, we've spent 15 years blaming each other for what's wrong. Let's all agree we want better jobs, better policing, city to be safer, city cleaner. How about if we focus on that instead of the rest? People kind of bought into it. I ended up winning that race with 62% of the vote with no runoff. Hmm. And I immediately met with every member of the council privately before they were sworn in and said, tell me what's important to you. And then I challenged them that we could no longer be our worst enemy. Mm -hmm. During that period of time in the 90s, most of America was beginning to move out of the Rust Belt toward the middle of the country. And that was this sort of healthy competition between Atlanta, Denver, Houston, Dallas for where they were going. Atlanta was killing us under the leadership of Maynard Jackson, they had created this brand of the city too busy to hate the city that had put racism behind them and we knew how that worked. Dallas was a city still mired by the memory of the Kennedy assassination mm -hmm. and couldn't get out of its own way. And what I convinced our council is look, all of these differences 
have to be resolved behind doors, but we cannot be our own worst enemy. And I, you know, ironically, I, I took a lesson that I learned from Maynard Jackson. And he always said, look, you're in the, the city business, but you're in the sales business. You're in the retail business. You are selling every family in business who moves to Austin. Did you don't want to just be in central Texas? You want to be in Austin, not Round Rock, not San Marcos. You want to invest your dollars and cents. This is the best place to raise your family, invest, um, build your, your brand, build your business. Anyway, we were able to get the council to slowly buy into it. Nothing works like success. We had a few successes in terms of passing the largest bond program ever, keeping our sports teams here, uh, winning a couple of major corporate battles. And the more it began to work, the easier it was for the council to buy into that model. But the one thing I learned, when you're the leader, people look to you to lead. That doesn't mean they're going to agree with everything you say. Many cases, they're not. Mm -hmm. But you're worse off not having a vision and a plan and waiting for consensus than saying, here's where I think we ought to go, letting them shoot at it. You have to be flexible enough to understand that vision's got to be enough, big enough to incorporate their dreams. But if you expect people, give them a chance, as I like to say, to put their paintbrush in that, in that painting. You don't give a damn about painting a Picasso if everybody who's a part of your team feels like, you know what, that little blob in the corner, that's mine. You give everybody a paintbrush, let them be a part of painting that vision. You've got a pretty good chance to succeed. And fortunately, in our case, it worked. You know, I want to ask you now about, obviously, you're part of the Obama administration. And President Obama just gave a terrific speech yesterday in Pennsylvania about the power of the vote. And yesterday, there was 13 days till the vote. He was imploring people in that Pennsylvania speech um, to not let up on the gas. He wanted people to vote. And so I know you're a big believer in that, too. Early voting. Uh, is, is, a, is a great predictor, but a lot of times the folks who are early voters are regular voters. And we want people who are non-traditional voters. We want 100% turnout, let's face it, right? A high turnout in the United States for federal elections is 60%. It seems like that's gonna be higher. But what, what got you um, connected to the Obama administration? And why, would you, why were you interested in after being mayor of Dallas being the U.S. trade representative and to, to you know, to, to be our ambassador on that score. What, what made you, and what, what, what things did you learn doing that? Because it seems like, you know, you go from secretary of state, you've obviously been working at legal law firms in between all this, uh, like I said, white shoe law firms, which are important law firms, and, and you become mayor. And then there's an interregnum from maybe 01 to 08, 09, um, and then you become um, U.S. trade rep. So what, what, uh, what got you involved on that, that, that federal post? Well, you know, it's interesting, and thank you for correcting me when we talked earlier about my work with Governor Richards, and I kept referring to 1994. Well, 1994 was the year I was Secretary of State. It was also the year that Congress passed something called NAFTA, which was then the largest multi country free trade agreement in the world. And Texas, Governor Richards, Democrats, Republicans were all fiercely fighting to get NAFTA passed. A year later, almost, I'm elected mayor of Dallas six months after NAFTA goes into effect. I've got the challenge of turning around a city that feels like it's always taken to some degree, a second stage in terms of business development to Houston, because Houston's got the port. Austin's sort of the intellectual capital of Texas mm. because it's got the legislature and the University of Texas. And I was asked, okay, what's your economic development plan? And, you know, I'm just a guy who all of a sudden's mayor. And I said, I'm going to make Dallas the capital city of NAFTA. You know, even being a lawyer, you know, I'm a classic lawyer, you know, politician. But I said, even, even with, with my rough sense of geography, we've just been given the greatest gift you could imagine. Here's now the largest free trade zone in the world. Here's Canada. Here's Mexico. 
and in my mind, roughly equidistant between Toronto and Mexico City on one hand, and then going east to west from Los Angeles to New York is Dallas Fort Worth Airport. Hmm. And I did, and I thought we are three and a, we're less than three and a half hours away from every major economic center in North America. If we can't make that work, shame on us. So I sort of fell into the power of international economic relations to do what I wanted to do, which was create wealth in Dallas by bringing businesses and companies into Texas that wanted to take advantage of NAFTA. So, and I would say this, anyone privileged to serve as mayor of any big city. If you look at what Sylvester Turner is doing, half of his time, he's out doing international missions promoting Houston. Mm -hmm. The same for the mayor of Los Angeles or New York, or Miami or Chicago or Atlanta, as great of a job as, it, as Maynard Jackson did in rebranding Atlanta, the most pivotal success he had was bringing the Olympics to Atlanta. Atlanta is a city half the size and geography of Dallas, Texas. But once they hosted the Olympics, I think something like 1,200 foreign companies relocated to Atlanta just in the 18 months after they had hosted the Olympics. So fast forward. I would add that his uh, Maynard, Maynard Jackson, the other, is building that airport. That Bill, airport. The, the, well, what a combination of that airport. Yeah. And, you're right. Yeah. But to fast forward it, you know, a big part of my work and the work of any big city mayor in particular is export promotion. Mm -hmm. Inward investment where companies not from Texas spend money, build plants in the United States is a big part of our economic success. And you would see this in any city in the country. Almost 25% of the jobs in the state of Texas are tied to international trade. So fast forward, I finished my tenure as mayor. As you know, I ran for the U.S. Senate in 2002, won the Democratic nomination, lost in the general election to John Cornyn. Um, during that campaign at an event in Chicago, this tall, skinny kid who was serving in the state legislature followed me out, got on the elevator, just the, he and I and two other guys, and shared with me his ambition to run for the U.S. Senate in Chicago and asked if I had any advice for him. And unfortunately, if he were with us today, he would cut me off and tell you the first thing I ever told him to do was change his name. <laughs> because, I mean, you think about it, 2002 yeah. is, yeah. you know, eight months after the, the, the horrific um, um, bombings of 9-11, Osama bin Laden is the most wanted man in the world. And now I'm on the elevator with a kid named Barack Hussein Obama. And I'm like, dude, you'll never get elected to anything. Well, we see how that turned out. But when he ran for senator, I remembered him. A number of people who had worked for my Senate campaign, including Robert Gibbs, who ended up his first communications director, um, I met him, I brought him to Texas, we supported him, we became great friends, and we bonded, um, Pinnell, not as much about politics, but I was a little bit flattered that he knew when I ran for mayor that my daughters were only six and three years old, mm -hmm. which was exactly the same age Sasha and Malia were when he later ended up running. He knew that my wife was this powerhouse, you know, financial expert with a degree from Warden. Of course, he had been married, you know, to Michelle. So our initial bonding was much about how the hell did you convince Matrice to let you do this? But I recognized immediately that he was incredibly bright with a heart for public service for all the right reasons. And I just, I don't know that it ever entered my consciousness that he would be president, but I knew he was the type of person we needed in Washington. And then the rest, you can sort of draw a line from that. When he ran, I was an early supporter. Mm -hmm. I had scratched every itch I had. I had no desire to go back in government. But when he asked, when a president 
someone who has been elected president calls and asks you to serve. I think you have to be flattered. They believe you have something additive to bring. And the only answer is yes. Now, even when it came to your confirmation, um, there was a point where uh, we think about process, right? Especially during the Obama administration and now, there are times where um, uh, the opposing side held up uh, confirmations in the Obama administration. And I think the reason why I wanna mention that is I wanna segue into talking about voting rights, but also Washington state legislatures. It seems the process has broken and been broken down, just, just normative processes. And we're thinking even before this current Supreme Court nomination process, we saw with Merrick Garland, the process broke down. Merrick Garland wasn't afforded a hearing uh, and the respect of process, whether he was voted up or down that Judge Amy Coney Barrett is being afforded right now, right? Well, not only Barrett, but Gorsuch and Kavanaugh. Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, absolutely. And others. absolutely. So I, I wanna talk about that in terms of that breakdown of process, right? In the sense of um, what we saw during the Obama administration is that even though he won two uh, federal elections quite handedly, um, there was a lack of voter enthusiasm in 2010 and 2014, right? And in a lot of ways, that helped stymie the process. Of Obama, there were 300 uh, appellate uh, uh, judges that he tried to put in that just never went filled because of process. And, and, and the Republicans got the Senate by 2015. Um, they got the House by January of 2011. Um, and certainly, I want to talk about how voting is so integral and connected to that process, right? Because sometimes we think that um, if we just vote in presidential elections, uh, that's all that matters. But there are, are these other, not just midterm elections, but local elections. I think one of the things that Black Lives Matter has revealed to the country and to activists and young people is that it counts who's gonna be your uh, district attorney. It, it counts who's on the local city council. It counts um, these very granular positions, who's part of the state legislature. And that's going to be connected to cash bail and money bail systems. It's going to be connected to not just things like property taxes and, and building codes, but really connected to school discipline. Who's on the local school board? If you're a Black girl or a Black boy, are you getting kicked out and expelled for this little prank that you did? Or are you getting detention? Or are we just giving you a second, third chance like white counterparts? So I want to talk to us, uh, want to have this discussion. And me and you have had disagreements too. So, I mean, we've had lively discussions <laughs> in the sense of- um, well, but, th but this one, I agree with you. And I, look, let me, let me make this, because you asked about mayor and the pro you asked a number of things. One, I'm going to try, I think you first asked about the process and why, and it is broken. And the problem each side, we point to the Merrick Garland nomination, Republicans go, oh, it goes back to Robert Bork. Um, you know, who was nominated, I want to say, in 84. Uh, and it was the first really brutal confirmation that dug in. That was 87. I think that was 1987. Was it 87? Yeah, I know it was 80s. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, one, I've always been influenced by the wisdom of Lord Benson, who I had worked for and was there. And he always believed that, in, that advice and consent responsibility of the U.S. Senate is that, and the test should be, does Pinnell Joseph have the intellectual ability and integrity to serve as a justice of the US Supreme Court? Not does Pinnell Joseph think the way I think about voting rights, civil rights, reproductive rights. Now that may be high-minded, but I do think one argument um, as hypocritical as Lindsey Graham is, the most powerful argument he's been able to make for Amy Coleman Barrett, going back to Justice Marshall, going back to Ruth Ginsburg. Ruth Ginsburg was confirmed to the Supreme Court with 97 votes, meaning Republicans who knew she was one of the most liberal, fiercest fighters for women's rights, looked at her and said, this is as brilliant a litigator as principal a lawyer, and they voted to confirm her. 
somehow we have to get back to that. Now, the reality we have gotten to a world now is that we know, and Republicans have frankly been much better tactically on this than Democrats, that elections have consequences. And I, you go back to 2016, Democrats still sit here and dis, derisively say, how can evangelicals vote for Donald Trump? And I don't think evangelicals give a look about Donald Trump as much they cared about the fuck Donald Trump said, you know what? You want the Supreme Court, you can have it. And as we know, the animating issue for them for the last 60 years has been Roe versus Wade. Yeah. For whatever reasons, Democrats decided, oh, well, we don't like Hillary, we don't this. And, and tragically, we know Donald Trump didn't win as much as the fact Hillary Clinton got 5 million fewer Democratic votes than Barack Obama did. And the consequence was a Senate that became more partisanly Republican, which strengthened the hand of Mitch McConnell, and they had the ability to fill these spots on the court. And so one of the points you made, we can't just fall in love with John Kennedy and Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. You've got to care about who's mayor. When I'm mayor of Dallas, in the four years before I became mayor, Dallas had cases as brutally ugly as anything you have ever seen with George Floyd, Eric Garner, Tatiana Jefferson. Anybody in Dallas can tell you about Etta Collins, a 90-year-old Black woman who called the police to her house at 10 o'clock at night because she believed her house was being broken into. And the police showed up and shot a 90-year-old Black woman through her screen door, dead. So that's the environment I inherited. But if you don't think that voting for a progressive mayor and council, within a year of mayor, we have an African-American mayor, we have our first majority, minority and female city council, we have our most progressive police chief we've ever had in the history of Dallas, we have an African-American city manager, an African-American city attorney, and all of a sudden we invested and embraced community policing more aggressively than any other city in the South. Now, it didn't mean that we solved all of our problems, but structurally we at least had put the institutions in place to have a different conversation and dialogue about it. And for this issue of criminal justice reform, you correctly know it's going to happen at City Hall and at that district attorney's office. And so if you just vote for Kamala Harris and to be vice president and Joe Biden, or you vote for Donald Trump, I know this is a bipartisan, I hope this is a bipartisan office, <laughs> and you walk away, you're doing nothing to yeah. get to the core of this issue of policing. Because by you not voting, you grant a disproportionate amount of power to the only, in most cases, the only public employee union association that is allowed to publicly endorse in the state of Texas are police and fire associations. No other group of po political employees are allowed to do it. So when we don't vote, that's why you see all of these ads now that in spite of the horrors and what we know is real about the disparate treatment of poor people and young black men, those police unions never endorse any public office holder who calls for more accountability or calls for constraints on their more aberrant behavior. And that's why it's important that you have to vote all the way down the line and critically, maybe even more uh, important for local elected officials who will not only make sure that we adequately fund the police, and I want to make it plain, nobody is talking about defunding the police. And if you think about that horrible ha tragedy we had in Dallas three years ago, when five officers were gunned down horrifically downtown, our police chief, David Brown, become became one of the most respected in the country 
And one of the things he said over and over again is stop asking us to do everything. We're not homeless czars. We're not mental health advocates. All we're talking about now is giving the police what they've said. Let's make sure our funding reflects that reality that we ought to have people whose talents in a civilian capacity that can address these other issues. But if you don't vote for the mayor, for the city council, for the members of the school boards, those issues will never be addressed. All right, I'm gonna um, start with questions now. I do wanna note though, um, in terms of the 97 to 0 uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg vote, I think one of the things that's also a nonpartisan issue or should, but that has become a vote, partisan issue is just voting rights. And I think one of, one of the biggest crippling threats to our democracy is that unlike right now with second amendment rights and gun rights, where we say, look, this is enshrined in the constitution, we have more second amendment rights and gun rights than we do voting rights in the United States of America. Well, so, one of the things we need to do in this election, no matter what ha Amy K um, um, Coney Barrett does with what I hope will be a solid progressive democratic majority in the House and Senate, we will pass the John Wright's, John Lewis um, Civil Rights Act and do what the courts uh, have taken away, away from us in the Shelby case. While I would rather it be upheld in the courts, but Congress will have it within its wherewithal to put in place a new Voting Rights Act and address many of these efforts that we've seen to suppress the vote from Texas to Alabama and Mississippi. Because what we are seeing is what we call at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, the Alabamification uh, <laughs> of America. Yeah. Because they pass it in these Southern states with overwhelming Republican legislators. If you go back to the 20 term midterms, everything these Republican governors did can be boiled down to two things, more restrictions on voting and restrictions on women's reproductive rights. And if we are willing to vote in record numbers, reclaim those seats, we can pass legislation to cure that. All right, let's start with the questions. Um, we have one question here. Um, you talked about the division that you faced in Dallas in the 90s was similar to the national discourse today. Uh, what suggestions and guidance uh, in terms of bringing people together, especially folks who want to get involved at the local level um, during this hyper-partisan time, uh, since neither side's rhetoric is going to change in the aftermath of this election immediately. You know, you've got to invest time in finding out, finding what other people care about. And the interesting thing, and one of the reasons you asked, and I loved serving as U.S. Trade Representative, there is nothing more powerful than seeing us through the eyes of the world. Because when we're here, we're so focused on our hyper-partisanship, our race issues. When you're in Africa and India, it is a powerful, almost spiritually reviving reminder that people just come up to you and go, you're an American. I don't wanna hear about all that other crap. You have the ability to vote on your leaders and you have your ability to send your kids to public school. And that's why people from all over the world bring their kids here. When we're here though, and we get in those boxes, it's easy to forget, we really do sort of want the same things. And one of the things I did, Pinnell, I just spent to whoever asked the question, thank you. I invested six months in forcing my council to talk to one another. And what I tried to get them to do is before we just show up and say, oh, he's a liberal Democrat, you're a progressive Republican. Why don't you find out that you and Pinnell both have daughters who want to do dance? Yeah. Or maybe you sit down and have dinner and find out both of you have a special needs kid. Mm -hmm. Or you find out that neither one of your spouses wanted you to be a college professor and wanted you to go. Find something that gives you common ground that mm -hmm. when you walk in that chamber, you don't see conservative, Republican, you know, immigrant bashing this. You see your friend Pinnell with a common deal and mm -hmm. realize, you know, at the end of the day, 
We're both trying to get here. And I'm not saying that solves it all, but we have to see each other as people first with common dreams, common fears, common aspirations. And if you can do that, at least you give yourself a chance to lower the rhetoric a little bit. And you have to be willing to give and take. I mean, politics doesn't always have to be, you know, a winner take all deal. And I won more than I lost. I won 95% of the votes that I took as mayor. I had a 15 member council. In seven years, I had one eight to seven vote, which I won. And I pulled it down until I could satisfy three of those seven who voted against it to give them what they needed to get on board because it made them feel like they had been respected as part of the process. And the one thing at least I like about local government, I know it's a little bit of a fiction, but in, in Dallas is different than Houston, Austin different than Dallas, but in Dallas, we still run nonpartisan. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows I was Secretary of State, Dan Richards, you know, all of the other candidates went out and said I'm a Republican, but at least by me running as someone that wanted to bring the city together, I was endorsed by Roger Staubach and Nancy Brinker. I made sure every time I did any event, I had people of color, I had Democrats, I had Republicans. I had to visually, graphically demonstrate that I had the, the ability to reach across the aisle, reach across ethnicities, reach across income lines, try to help people find common ground. And I think the best leaders do that. That's one of the reasons you were talking about. And I just think it's so refreshing when people hear President Obama speak, the contrast be between him and I would, and, and I'd say Joe Biden and the current occupant of the White House is one that reminds people what we see good about government, what we see good about our leaders. Well, I wanna, you know, you talked about President Obama and uh, uh, Joe Biden, but, and even the current president, I want to, I have a great question um, about youth and young people, um, which is so important. Cause I do think that right now in 2020, um, especially uh, because of, um, the age of the current president and the age of his opponent, a lot of young people are very, very dispirited because it is really increasingly going to become their country, and they're not seeing themselves reflected um, um, in in this in this instance. But this question says many citizens, especially younger folks from marginalized communities, feel that their votes are often taken for granted, and that um, especially the Democratic Party. Um, uh, takes their vote for granted. Um, what ways can we create a system where these individuals do not feel ostracized from the electoral process? Does this take place at the national level? Uh, is it in the form of a parliamentary system or at the local level, putting more emphasis on local races and the impact that it has on their lives? What does the strategy look like beyond election years and electoral politics? Well, the, the, e the, the easy answer, which you may not like, you got to vote. Nobody takes you for granted. You don't vote. Look, we live in a world in which we will sadly celebrate that maybe 65% of Americans vote in this presidential election. When you look in the rest of the world, the voter participation is either universal or 90, 80%. That drop off is pretty dramatic. A non-presidential year, a gubernatorial election, election, excuse me, we may have only <laughs> thinking about Rudy Giuliani and Borat, no. <laughs> and, but the drop off from president to governor is like 20 points. The drop off from that, I was elected mayor of Dallas with, for Dallas, a high water mark of 28% of the people voting. Today, it's down to 13%. So one, I tell people, if you're one of the few people who vote, Think of the return on your investment. So young people, I would contrary, neither the Democrat or the Republican parties um, uh, ignore you. You don't vote. The good news is when you do, it resonates. So let me give you a better example. Barack Obama is president almost singularly because of what young people did. You use the power of social media to completely wire around 
the traditional democratic infrastructure that all predicted that Hillary Clinton was gonna cruise to the democratic nomination. And you actually, you mobilized, you organized, there were no committees for Obama, you formulated your own groups and you turned out to vote. We have marriage equality in this country today almost singularly because it's young people in conversations with your parents who are my age continued to challenge us and go, why do you give a damn, you know, who Joseph or Sheila is in love with? And if you think about how quickly we changed the national conversation value proposition around marriage equality, that was because of young people. We have the Voting Rights and Civil Rights Act, not because of a bunch of people my age, and I know you've heard it, but Dr. King was, wasn't 34 years old when he led the largest civil rights movement and was killed. John Lewis was part of a group called Students for a Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Mm -hmm. They were in their 20s and 30s. Every big social wage of change in the world has been led by young people. Nelson Mandela was 27 years old when he went to prison. So all you have to do is look at history and look at the power of young people to mobilize, to organize, to vote, and you can make a huge difference. You will be one of the deciding factors in this election. But what you have to do is back that up and continue to exercise that authority and that power in gubernatorial elections and local elections and others. And rather than looking at Joe Biden and or um, if you will, Donald Trump and saying, these guys are well into their 70s. What you should see is that the one thing we know, neither Joe Biden or Donald Trump is likely to be president four years from now. That is a huge opportunity for the next generation of Americans to step up and lead. We would, if you take away these last two elections and look at the presidency, since Dr. Joseph and I have been talking about it, our presidential leaders have been on generationally a downward trend since Ronald Reagan. We went from Reagan to Bush, to Clinton, to Bush, to Obama. The exception was this last election. So I would argue you have an extraordinary amount of power. The question is, are you gonna exercise it? And more critically, Look at the age of mayors around the country. Mm -hmm. I mean, the mayor of Minneapolis, St. Paul, is not 40 years old. I was 40 years old when I was elected the mayor of Dallas. Look at our young leaders now. I mean, look at Marion Bowser in Washington, D.C., Keisha Bottoms in Atlanta. Young mayors are transforming this country and doing wonderful things. That can be you. And not only can you do it at City Hall, you can do it on the school board, you can do it as district attorneys, you can do it in the county commissioner's courts. Well, I think um, I want to I wanna just add before getting to the next question, what can we do? Because I remember Barack Obama, after he won re-election 2012, in his victory speech, he said people had been waiting hours and hours online and we have to fix that. And people um, gave him a, you know, a huge round of applause. But what I think we don't talk enough about, and this should be bipartisan, is guaranteeing the right to vote. But as you know, from being trade rep and being mayor, process matters. So when you think about process, I'm thinking about things where one at the federal level and the state like Oregon does this already, we register our 18 year olds to vote. Just like there's a selective service system. And I remember uh, filling out my selective service card that, and I filled it out at 17. I wasn't even 18 yet. They sent it to you in anticipation of you being 18, filled it out, selective service. I thought I was being drafted. My mom had to explain. It's not, you're, you're okay. I said, mom, <laughs> mom, what's <Yeah>. happening? <laughs> He said, you're okay, you're buddy. You, 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 know, you know, I said, I said, mom, am I going to go to the military? I'm trying to go to college, mom. And she said, you're fine, Eddie. You're fine. You got you to read the fine print. You're fine. So what can we do for process where, one, we register all Americans to vote. We register young people to vote. 
We provide a voting holiday, whether that's Tuesday, whatever day we do it. We provide child care and elder care. I'm a parent, so I know that you, 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 you need to, to, to have care. You're, you're a parent as well. Um, but also that we connect this to civic activism and participation. We want to make the claim that we're the world's greatest democracy, but we have elected officials, including the Texas governor and others, tripping over themselves to prevent people from voting. I think it's really shocking and dispiriting for millions of young people to know that, to know that, look, uh, because there's one level of saying, well, because of what our ancestors did, we should cherish the right to vote. I agree with you. I agree with that. But I can see a more, I won't even call it cynical, but it's a disappointed point of view saying, look, how come there are so many different forces trying to prevent me from voting? Because we did not vote. You answered your own question, because we did not vote. And again, I know we're trying to be reasonably nonpartisan, but vote for and put heed pick up the phone and call Greg Abbott and say, shame on you. Pick up the phone and call our Lieutenant Governor who is actively doing everything President Trump asked him to do. That was not a hollow statement when President Trump in response to that question about the Proud Boys says, somebody's gotta make sure we ensure the integrity of the ballot. That is no accident that Greg Abbott and our Lieutenant Governor have done everything they can to within the last three months saying, all of a sudden, we're only gonna have one drop off box in all of Tarrant County and Harris County. Elect people who will respect your like right to vote. You do it, it is the law in the state of Texas that when you get a driver's license, when you apply for state assistance, you're supposed to be given an application to vote. We're not doing it under the Republican leadership that's in place right now. But if we take back the House um, in, the, in the state legislature, if we can make sure we have at least one Democratic elected official in the state of Texas in 2020, 2022, we can begin to make sure that we are a state that accommodates the rights of the people rather than suppresses them. I tell people, te people, Texas is not as much a red state. We're a non-voting state. And we're a non-voting state because our statewide elected officials don't want you to vote. And you should understand they don't want you to vote because they're afraid of what happens when you do. And if you will just understand the reason they don't want you to vote is the reason that you need to vote and exercise that power I promise you, we can turn this around and we can turn it around within the next 24 months. Yeah, we've got some great questions. Um, as former mayor of Dallas, are there any concerns you had for the city then that are still present now? If so, how would you suggest civically engaged residents go about informing themselves and attempting to resolve these concerns and issues? My biggest concern with Dallas is we are still a city that grossly um, that grossly just doesn't accommodate first generation African American and Hispanic citizens and participating in one of the wealthiest cities in the country. The wealth gap between the Anglo community and the African American and Hispanic community in Dallas is one of the largest in the country. My answer for that is, is, is too long, but unlike Houston and Austin, Dallas, Texas, when I was elected mayor in 1995, was the only city in North America, over a million people without a state supported institution. And whatever you may think Austin's challenges would be, the existence of Houston Tillotson and the University of Texas and St. Edwards and Austin Community College. Everybody in Austin, if they want to, has a place to get an affordable higher education mm -hmm. or go to community college. Everybody who lives in Houston, um, whether they want to or not, can go to the University of Houston or Texas Southern or Rice or so many others. In Dallas, for the most part, we have not addressed the need for affordable, accessible, 
education for first generation, for the most part, black and Hispanic kids. And that has held us back because if you don't have the basic educational skills, you really can't take advantage of all these economic opportunities. We've addressed that by creating the University of North Texas, but the city needs to fundamentally understand we just cannot be a city in which the quality of life, access to jobs, access to financing is as disparate and glaring as it is North and South. We're slowly beginning to do that, but Dallas has to realize empowering, enabling, employing young African-American and Hispanic and immigrant families doesn't detract from Anglo families. It just makes the pie bigger. It makes the economic slice that much more dynamic. Okay, this question says, are you following any of the tensions in the current Texas Senate race? Uh, does this race say anything uh, important about the future of Texas politics? So um, obviously that's... Uh, you know, we will see. It is, again, I'm, <laughs> well, I guess I will be part of, look, it is, um, I ran against Senator Cornyn. He's a gentleman, but I don't see how you can be a Senator from the state of Texas with the largest number of citizens without health insurance, with a state that benefits from our relationship with Mexico and welcomes immigrants of all kinds more than any, and be silent and in fact work with this president to deny citizens health care and not stand up and educate this president about the need to have a safe border, but a border that welcomes people who wants to contribute to our economy. And it, I just think it is unacceptable for John Cornyn to say, oh, well, I disagreed with the president on these things. Now, I didn't say anything about it. I voted to go along. And whatever the challenges and issues might be between MJ Hager and Royce West, Democrats may differ about how fast, how far we ought to go about healthcare, but we are united in our belief that every child, every family ought to have access to healthcare. Democrats may disagree about how to reform our economy, but we're united in our belief that if we can afford to give corporations and the 100 wealthiest people in America a tax break, can't we afford to give every American family a minimum wage? So don't get caught up in the differences between Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders or Royce West and MJ Hager. Vote for people that understand that the prosperity, the richness of this country has to flow to every American family. And that America is stronger when all our children are raised in a home in which they've got a roof over their head, food on the table, the ability to get access to health care and access to a quality education. We have two questions here and they're really about third parties. Um, and these are folks who don't want people to vote for a third party, but they say they have friends who want to vote for a third party or uh, they say friends who say they're not interested in choosing between the lesser of two evils. Um, I'm gonna stop you right there. Yeah because I refuse to allow people to normalize Donald Trump in the context of our normal politics. Every cycle in my life, people have said, well, I don't want the lesser of two evils, you know? And if you were talking about Hillary Clinton versus Jeb Bush or George Bush versus Barack Obama, you know, I'd say fine. But Donald Trump is so outside the norms of American political orthodoxy. It is an insult to George Bush, to Ronald Reagan, to Mitt Romney, to whomever you think of as a principal Republican to say, oh, he's just like the others. He is not. He is flagrantly, blatantly appealing to the most racist, divisive, divisive elements of this country we've ever seen before. And the choices could not be more stark. I'm not going to quarrel with you if you say, oh, I don't believe there's any difference between the Democratic and the Republican parties. I happen to believe there is. And, I'll, and for all those Democrats 
who said that last time and said, oh, there's no difference between Hillary Clinton and, and um, Donald Trump. I think Do Donald Trump has made a lie of that proposition in extraordinary ways. And any other time, if you wanted to vote for a third party, that's your choice. But those of you who did that in 2016 are the reason that we now have three Republicans about to tilt the balance of the Supreme Court. It's a reason Mitch McConnell has been able to run over the Democratic Party and appoint almost 300 people to the federal judiciary, some of whom have never even tried a case. Many of them have been held to be unqualified by the American Bar Association. Your vote matters. I do believe we need a third party in the United States. Every other functioning democracy in the world gives you multiple choices, but until then, this is a binary choice. And it isn't just a choice between a difference of philosophies. In this case, I believe this is a choice between good and evil. I've seen them. We started out talking about my growing up in the segregated South. I know what evil looks like. I know what racism looks like. And Donald Trump is playing to that same dark element um, of America as much as George Wallace did in Lester Maddox or anyone else. And for me, this is not a case of a matter of gray. It is a matter of black and white. It's a matter of right and wrong. It's a matter of good and evil. And if nothing else, Joe Biden is one of the most decent people I've ever met in our life. And more than anything, we need a president who's gonna get us to begin to talk to rather than past one another and at least try to speak to our common beliefs and dreams rather than further than further dividing us. Well, that leads me to a question. You know, there's been some controversy because people have said that uh, in a future, uh, if, if Joe Biden were to win the presidency, that he's reached out to some Republicans to be in his cabinet and progressive Democrats who hear that and young people who hear that have been very, very um, upset about that. What, what do you think about that in the sense of um, um, this idea of uh, efforts at bipartisanship moving forward? You know, President Obama tried to do it uh, with Secretary of Commerce and others. Um, he kept the Secretary of Defense, uh, Bill Robert Gates. Um, so what do you think about that now, especially where there are some Republicans who are absolutely never Trumpers, but also then really diverge from the Democratic, I would say, mainstream in things like reimagining public safety, in terms of anti-racism, in terms of healthcare, in terms of equity and desegregation, all these different issues. What, where, where do you think uh, a potential Biden-Harris ticket, if there was an administration, should go? And I'm going to ask the question in the reverse way of, of as well, what would we do if the president is actually reelected? Uh, because I, I think that maybe some young people would lose hope, uh, especially considering what you just said about, about him and who he's playing up to. But we would still have to soldier on. If anything, our ancestors have taught us how to soldier on. Even One, you, you just, you vote. I, I can I, as much as I was bitterly disappointed with Donald Trump's election, I was not surprised. Whether we liked it or not, America didn't like Hillary Clinton. And they told us they didn't like Hillary Clinton, but we didn't listen. But I don't believe that's going to happen. And two, Joe Biden cannot talk about healing our country if he isn't willing to reach across the aisle and do that. And I know there's of you that say you can't. But listen, you asked me how I turned Dallas around, and I was willing to work with anybody who would work with me. Mm -hmm. Now, I know it wasn't as bitterly partisan, but you can't preach it if you aren't willing to practice it. Okay. My short answer, it will be a good thing. I think Joe Biden should do that. There are Republicans willing to work with this. It isn't gonna be all of them. He's not gonna reach out to Mitch McConnell, but there are Republicans that are willing to stand up and there are Republicans who have been willing to call BS on um, Donald Trump. And I think we have to work with them. Um, I know we said we were going to go to three, but I have one urgent matter that I'm going to have to. to ask oh yeah, so let, let me let me let me uh, let me thank you. For, let me thank you for the conversation. Um, we've been having our, our conversation with Ambassador Ron Kirk, former mayor of Dallas, 
uh, who's really one of the um, uh, most important, you know, African American leaders of, of the last uh, 30 years. I'm listening, but I'm on, on voting rights and, and 2020. So thank you, Ambassador Kirk. Um, you know, I forgot to introduce um, the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy when we started this. So I'll say that my name is Peniel Joseph. I'm the Barbara Jordan Chair uh, in Political Values and Ethics at the LBJ School of Public Affairs and a professor of history. Um, and this has been a webinar sponsored by the Center for the Race and uh, for the study of race and democracy, where we do work in public history uh, at the intersection of race, democracy, um, um, politics, and policy. And um, we've done a number of different uh, uh, programs and webinars. I want to thank Emily Dunkley, our program administrator, for, for helping to organize this. Thank all the CSRD fellows. Um, we have student fellows, undergraduate and graduate fellows who do research at this intersection of race and democracy. And um, thank all of you for, for joining us. Uh, we have early voting uh, in Texas until October 30th. Uh, we are very much um, interested in uh, voting participation. We're interested in civic participation. Uh, we're interested in everyone exercising their right to vote, irrespective of who they are voting for, right? Uh, voting is a deeply personal issue. Voting is um, anonymous, so people don't feel that kind of pressure. Uh, but I would, I, I really hope for a democracy where we get 100% voting turnout, and we're able to have people who are non able bodied vote, people who are young, people who are elderly. Um, it's disappointing uh, when the state of Alabama can prevent people from trying to vote by curbside in a pandemic. Uh, and that the Supreme Court says yes to that, we do need a post partisan Supreme Court. Our, in, our, our institutions are failing us because of process, uh, but also because of the divisions that are sown into our republic when we think about racial slavery and, and white supremacy and the, the, the caste system that was created uh, because of that. Uh, Ambassador Kirk, are you still here with us? So you can, can uh, say- a I am, I had to- <laughs> Okay. I had to sign something that I had to get, to get so, out. Real so, quick. you know, in, in closing, I'd say, you know, how, what, what are, I was telling everybody to vote, but what are some marching orders that you leave us with in terms of between now and November 3rd, but also after, because I tell my students, I tell everyone that look, after the election, and I'm prepared for any outcome. I do have to say that. I think that as citizens, we have to be. Uh, look, we, we, we have to be the most important thing is to vote, and then, but then to stay engaged. And again, the, the, to me, and I hope I didn't sound flippant or dismissive to the young person that said, hey, we feel like the parties take us for granted. You know, I've always told people, if you want to scare the hell out of every elected official in America, go vote. <laughs> I mean, Dr. Joseph talked about his dream of 100. I promise you, we pay attention to these. We look at who votes. We look at the numbers. We see where they come from. And that's who we speak to. I, I cannot tell you the shockwave you would send through Washington if the night of November 3rd, no matter who wins or loses, they said, oh my God, 80% of Americans went to the polls and voted. Every elected official in America would go, holy crap, they're paying attention. And if you don't think all of a sudden, rather than us just talking about healthcare and Medicaid and social security, we do that because seniors vote. You go to the polls show up every once in a while at City Hall. And I look, I know you you all are, bu are busy, but the one two you have, you understand social media in a way we don't. You are singularly responsible through TikTok of changing the dialogue and disrupting the political campaigns in a way that we have. But you have power to do it, to do it differently and just trust me, promise you, if you'll vote, we'll make a difference. We can change not only the course of this country, but the course of your state and the course of our city. So thank you all. I'm sorry I had to turn off for two minutes to, no, that's no to take care of that, but... but no, thank you. And, and I'm really, you know, I think I'm hopeful. I think that this has been 2020. It's been this extraordinary year. I think we do have this generational opportunity I think civic activism happens when we stay engaged. Uh, the way we stay engaged is to know that 
our rights as citizens are extended beyond the vote. They don't stop with the vote. And you stay engaged with your, your children's schools. You stay engaged with what's going on in the environment, what's going on in public safety. You stay engaged with food justice and housing affordability. Uh, you stay engaged in terms of um, US immigration policies and protecting those who are undocumented. Uh, having more, you know, think about the fairness doctrine and how we lost the fairness doctrine that you want to listen to um, uh, multiple sides of an issue uh, that were respective and civil. Part of what we've lost through ad hominem attacks is not having any kind of deep empathy for one another. So we have to stay engaged and it really democracy and citizenship is not a burden, but it's a responsibility. And that responsibility means that we stay engaged every single day and we become exemplars for our children, for our grandchildren uh, and each other. So I, you know, I salute you. Uh, you are one well, of those. Thank you. Uh, and I do want to say one thing. Look, we covered so much. I don't want you to feel like those of you, particularly young people still with us, we're not asking you to boil the ocean. I started out quoting my father's simple wisdom. You know, one of his other favorite sayings is, look, I'm not asking you to move the mountain, but you could get your shovel, right? <laughs> you know, you can, and so pick one issue you care about, whether it's immigrant rights or voting rights or women's reproductive rights, do what you can do and partner with all the rest of us who are doing what we can do collectively, we can make a difference. We've done it. That's how we got civil rights, voting rights. It's how you elected Ann Richards. It's how you elected Barack Obama. We've done it before, we can do it again. So God bless you all. God bless Texas to the Longhorns, hook them horns, and uh, let's go win this thing. Great, thank you so much, Ambassador Kirk, and thank you all for joining us. Mm -hmm.